it's time for the Ilya and John show, right? And this is uh, ISIS 3300. Uh, business ethics for a digital society drop in discussion session. Ah, and that is um, uh, our target article today. And I think uh, we'll go for about uh, a 90 minutes, I think, because I think uh, all of us would like to uh, go for lunch, maybe, perhaps, or get away from leaf blowers and dehumidifiers for a while. Because right? um, I had to turn it off, turn off. It would be kind of difficult to actually hear me over uh, the contraptions here, but I think I may have them later when we have our MBIT meeting, you know? um, because I can tell people, you know, look what I'm having to deal with. Yeah. I'm actually teaching in a wind tunnel. <laughs> so, <laughs> you want to say mobile computer, right? I always thought, you know, uh, that's not actually true because people aren't really mobile. They're kind of usually standing still at least, right? Oh, hey, how are you? Greetings, right? Um, that uh, doing things online like this means that, you know, people can talk like this, like we are, right? Or they can yeah. do the graffiti. You know what I mean? The kind of graffiti text, right? Um, and, and I think maybe if when we get back into the physical space, if we ever do, right? Maybe that's something that we should try and work on, you uh, know, in, in, in our classroom presentation. You know, because uh, I don't know if have you been in any experiments, Ilya, with clickers, those uh, no, devices no. or those clicker apps, where students no, have an app or device, right? Yeah. Yeah. The only, they, only no, clicker it, it's no way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, we all know that in a classroom situation, uh, yes. there'll always be students that kind of stand out and talk a lot and. You know, engage in discussions and other people that are kind of more shy, right? And, yeah. and I think it depends on people's personalities, right? And I think, I, I, I don't know what kind of a student you were, Ilya. Were you the kind of student that would always go, ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, here's the answer to the question, that kind of thing. You're sitting in the front row, for example, right? And meanwhile, everybody else is crammed into the back row, right? I don't know, making paper planes or, you know, and looking at porn on the stones or something like that, right? Oh! I was, always, uh, 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 I was always sitting right at the front because I, I, I really hated um, yeah, not really participating at all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I well, used no, to, I, I think you think. Thing, so, yeah. Oh, so but no, you are you a diligent student, Paul. Oh, very good, very good. Thanks. You. Uh, um, I, I think you were, you must have been a diligent student. Uh, uh, not part. really. I heard. Yeah, I, I just like sitting in the front because uh, the teachers used to pick on the people at back. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I use reverse psychology. <laughs> well, well, you know that uh, Vince Bruno, has, I think, uh, a face of its database, right, which I think you've been working on for the past few yeah. semesters. So apparently it's tied into the main RMIT database, so when students actually I guess input, uh, well, the, the admin people uh, input their details from their student ID cards, right? So there's faces yeah. and names, for example. So pe people then, uh, academics can, can potentially pull up uh, a face and a name. So you can actually see who you're actually pointing at and refer to them by name, you know? Which is yeah. kind of, um, which is not actually a new idea. It may be kind of digital now, but apparently at Harvard University in their law school, some professors would do that uh, in a kind of ancient way. They would have like a seating chart uh, of people in the lecture theatre with names and faces, right? And then they would just open up the seating chart at the start of, of the lecture or class, right? And then, you know, point at people and say, uh, what's this? Did you do the homework, etc., that kind of thing. So where some law, and, and this is kind of a Socratic uh, dialogue technique. So. It's basically a lazy way to teach. So, in other words, instead of actually having PowerPoint slides or, or, or writing on a blackboard, uh, the professor just assigns the work for the next class. Because you have to read chapter 23 and, and know it back to front, right? And then yeah. the law professor comes in the next class, opens up the seating uh, uh, chart, and just says, Mr. Adania, uh, um, oh yeah, naming, uh, in here. Yeah. 
uh, Mr. Ananiev, uh, you know, what what happened to the plaintiff in Smith versus uh, Canopy, uh, 20, uh, 1923, that kind of thing. And you have to know it. And if yeah. you don't know it, then you're kind of embarrassed. And then the guy calls on somebody else and so forth, right? So it, it, it's really a very tense way of teaching. Teacher called the names and people were afraid of being called. Ah, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> exactly. You see, that's what we should do. I think we should do that. We don't need names and faces. We've just got a, a list of people. We'll just go through the list alphabetically, right? And then the people, anybody with a surname of Z, right, can stress out. Yeah? So they, they ran out of time. Phew. And the next day, now we're starting with Z. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but okay, uh, now we're back in uh, um, coronavirus corner, where this um, discussion usually ends up, you know. And thanks, Ilya, for kind of nicely um, editing these and, and putting them into the right uh, space. And uh, I think you had problems last time with the uh, YouTube uh, copyright police, right? And yeah. I think you figured out a way to bypass that. Um, and um, yeah, and, and thanks for that. So uh, this week, we're, the target article is uh, privacy perspectives on contact tracing as a uh, pandemic response. And I think uh, it's a nice little article because it um, fits into the theme this week because we have in Australia uh, an app, what's it called? It's the coronavirus trying to find the app page. Coronavirus um, safety app? Uh, safety app. Ah, that's it, yeah. Uh, you're going to beat me to it, probably. Did you find it? Ah, okay. No, I'll okay. see if I uh, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. I'll pull it up. Uh, on it now, there is an application called NCOV. The track the status of everyone to manage. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I think we have uh, something similar. This that was released. Uh, okay, come on. And is that you or me? Oh, you've got it, Ismet. Yeah. That's me, that's me, that's me, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, uh, the COVID Safe app speeds up uh, contacting people uh, exposed to the uh, coronavirus. This helps. Um, helps us support and protect you, your uh, friends and family. Please read the content on this page before downloading. Uh, and a nice little logo and uh, lots of stuff to read, etc. And uh, and there's been a lot of chatter about this in various places, online, talkback radio, etc. And uh, some people have been concerned about uh, uh, with respect to the COVID safe app. Uh, and it's this week's theme, this week's theme uh, in the uh, things uh, that, that are related to uh, privacy, especially privacy in, in the digital age. And I said, Ilya, did you download this app? No, I didn't. Uh, one of our, one of our family had, uh, I, I, uh, I'm a bit suspicious about it. Um, is it is ah, it okay, why are you suspicious? What says people are afraid of being tracked? Yes, exactly. Oh, That's yeah. right. Because uh, they, they say it's only a Bluetooth connection to uh, other Bluetooth devices around it. But uh, obviously, I, I think they go through, uh, <coughs> you know, looking for your, your GPS type <coughs> location as well, track where you've been and all that sort of. <coughs> and I, I don't of, really uh, know if someone's got a virus beside me. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I just just don't um, don't feel like I should should download it. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I mean, the thing is, um, from what I was understanding, uh, it's 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 actually uh, kind of uh, through Bluetooth working out um, yeah. the number of people that you come into contact with uh, each day. And recording that somewhere where nobody can find this information, unless one of the people that you come into contact with or you are then diagnosed with COVID-19, and then they can go into the database where this, um, you know, detail uh, location details are kept, and they can contact all the people that you came into uh, 
contact with uh, during that date or whatever the time period is. Um, and uh, and it seems kind of benign, but, uh, but the thing is, uh, in, yeah. in the back of my head, I was kind of paranoid. What, what, you know, for example, what if... Yeah. See, here it is yeah. here, right? There's, there's the yeah. actual um, app. Right? And if you yeah. go down to permissions, I don't know whether you can see that. that. That's what I was concerned about. <clears throat> What does that say? Maybe you need to read it out. It's a precise location GPS coordinates. It, it needs access to the GPS, not just. Oh, it okay. Doesn't just do Bluetooth. And as soon as I saw this thing here, I said, No, no, it's not, I'm not going to download it. But maybe you need to have precise locations. I mean, if you've come into contact with people, right? If yeah. if you just had uh, Bluetooth tracking. And it gives you uh, a number of people that you've come into contact with. Say, say you're walking through the streets of Melbourne, right? In an average day, how many people do you walk past? Maybe 20, 30 people, for example, right? So if yep. if the app would just kind of record you've actually encountered 30 people, would that actually help anybody? I mean, you need to have some kind of fixed location there. Am I correct? Because otherwise, then okay. it, uh, how do people know? No, I. Yeah. Okay there it's for the I'd say uh, if you're in you know crowded areas like city city roads whatever yeah but for where, where right. I am uh, I have no comfort like my my driveway is 300 meters and my closest uh, neighbor is about four four to five hundred meters away oh wait a minute I just have to bring up something so, so uh, we, we don't really need this thing yeah, yeah, so to speak because I don't I just have to bring up a picture of um, uh, Ilya's house. Um, <laughs> right? uh, oh yeah, hold it. Um, oh, this is so cool. it's, it's, it's kind of it's struggling. Not uh, uh, okay. uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, it's, you see, that's in the uh, right hand corner, South Fork Ranch, the scene of the TV series Dallas, right? So, Ilya got it with steel, you know, because nobody watches Dallas anymore. Uh, and, so, and he actually moved the whole thing to the suburb in the far northwest. I have my own. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Actually, moon, apparently. If you are on the moon. <laughs> you know, um, uh, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. He does say it looks like uh, South Fork Ranch, right? I don't know, actually, um, he's got a lot of grazing land. It's that's the earliest thing of, uh, of, uh, of buying some cattle, right? Digital cattle, maybe. Um, so, because you know, it's like uh, it doesn't, his cows won't move, they'll actually have ring toe or moo toe. <laughs> oh, our neighbors are aboard. That's it, you see what I mean? That's what I'm saying, right? That's what we need to have. Yeah. Neighborhood watch, we need to have a COVID 19 watch. So, I saw somebody sneezing on the corner of, you know. Uh, a, a little jerk in Elizabeth Street, right? Woo, woo, woo! The, 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 the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right, you know. But, um, what was oh, yeah, a Bluetooth, right? So, uh, I, I don't know, it, Ilya, do you remember a, a short-lived fad called Bluetooth? I tried to look up Bluetoothing now, but apparently Bluetooth toothing now is a way of taking drugs. Into <laughs> but, but I don't think it's connected to what I'm thinking of. Oh, the reason why uh, location permission you know, is oh, you low energy Bluetooth, of course, yes, Bluetooth, yeah, because Bluetooth is short distance, for example, right? Uh, whereas I think GPS is you know from a satellite, etc. Right? Continually spying on it at the moment. I think even the National Security Agency is, is putting, um, you know every word and body movement. Make at the moment, you know, and, uh, well, my understanding is that um, 
but my understanding was that the application was supposed to use purely uh, Bluetooth and it would communicate with other Bluetooth devices in within, you know, like the proximity, like, uh, I don't know, two, two three metre range. <coughs> so, it was yeah. supposed to, so it was supposed pretty to... Pretty close. Up, pretty yeah, close. Yeah, but it was supposed to pick up or, or keep, keep a registry of the IDs of the other devices that have been uh, close to you. So if one of those people that have one of those devices end up getting uh, reported as um, uh, having the virus, then their device would show the list of people that have, uh, or the IDs that have been in oh, the yeah, yeah. But the thing is, um, yeah, yeah. then it doesn't actually say where, right? So I thought no, it, must, it must use GPS as well. So ID of the device plus location. Google is to be blamed for this. They changed it after Android 6. Yes. Yes. I think the Google is, that Google is the cause of the, all the ills in the world. They probably produce they coronavirus because they're the working on, you know, <laughs> you know, because Google has its fingers in every pie, you know. I mean, uh, they had an article uh, in Time magazine uh, a year or two ago. It was a cover article. Google is searching for the secret of immortality, you know. And, uh, and I think the reason why Time ran that article is because around about that time, Google hired Ray Kurzweil, and Ray Kurzweil is like this famous uh, American inventor, innovator, and in recent times he's made a, a name for himself with a concept called the singularity. You heard the singularity, Ilya? Yes, I've, I've heard that. Uh, uh, you know, yeah. Well, the, the thing is, like in the not too distant future, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people will basically uh, live forever. Uh, because um, because uh, you know they'll be able to upload their consciousness into this kind of you know uh, global digital infrastructure, right? And then uh, and and Google has deep pockets, and what they do is they always uh, poach anybody that is interested, right? Uh, and and it's interesting how they actually do that. It's not like you know the, somebody has a wacky idea about something, it, it you know. It sells a lot of books or has kind of a lot of people viewing TED Talks or whatever. And then they hire that person as a, as a research fellow. And, and being a, G a Google research fellow means that you don't have to work a day in your life, right? Uh, and, and Google's kind of uh, actually bought uh, people that potentially could be their competition. I think it's really clever. I think it's almost like, well, you know, these people could go off and start a company that could compete with Google. But no, let's just make them research fellows. Will give them so much money that they don't need to feel they have to work. They can just think occasionally, right? and uh, and so forth. And, and you know, um, another person I think you joined Google uh, recently. Oh, there. Oh, yes. And you oh, okay. Ah. Oh. <laughs> yes. Oh, Google. Oh, oh. Singularity. So, 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 Ilya, are you dreaming of being poached by anybody, or are you <laughs> more? <laughs> <laughs> because it's more like uh, it's, it's it's like Hollywood, for example, right? Uh, you know, like if if you're a big star, for example, right? Uh, or they, it, you make a hit movie, and then some studio will put you under contract just so that you don't work for anybody else, right? and then occasionally they'll make you do things, etc. That kind of thing, you know, like a, a guest appearance on Dancing with the Stars or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that should be, you know, your aim in life, eventually to be on Dancing with the Stars. You know Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple? Uh, yes. Was. Of course, yep. He, the, he was actually the, on Dancing the, with the, Apple, the Stars. The Mr. Apple. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and he was actually uh, uh, a contestant on Dancing with the Stars. Um, uh, for some strange reason, they ran out of celebrities, right, and they thought, well, this is as close as we can get to Steve Jobs because I think he had passed away by then. So we'll get Steve Wozniak to appear on Dancing with the Stars. So, uh, and around about that time, Woz came to uh, Melbourne and there's a company in Australia and they bring out um, academics and thinkers and innovators and people pay like you know lots of money to see them. So, and I think he kind of fell in love with Australia and then there was a news uh, headline saying, oh, Woz! decides to move to Tasmania. Tasmania. And 
mainlanders forget that we have a state called Tasmania, right? And that's probably why the Wolves would live there, you know, because it's so secluded. You could buy half of it, you know. And it's called Wazland. <laughs> but if you watch, if you watch, uh, I think Steve Jobs, uh, the a movie um, about Steve Jobs' life, uh, I think um, Wozniak is played by uh, Seth Rogen, I think, in that. And uh, there's all these interesting scenes because, you know, uh, apparently Woz was the brains of Apple originally. He was the, the true hacker, geek, etc. And Steve Jobs basically added the panache or the salesmanship, right? Or the celebrity uh, status of Apple, right? And and I think Woz has a scene in the movie where he says something like, "You, you can't, you can't code, you can't do this, you don't know this, etc." What do you do here? This is, and, and Jobs just says something like, "Well, uh, I'm the ringmaster." I feel like. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the better one. It's, uh, it's uh, I think, a Michael Fassbinder. It's, uh, where he's giving one of his big um, re- releases, you know, like for the iPhone or the iPad or whatever, right? And he, yeah. he's in this huge uh, arena or, or, or uh, like a stadium in um, San Francisco, right? And he says that before he comes on stage, right, he wants to have, you know, everything completely done, right? And he's complaining because you know how they have those signs above the exit doors so that in red, fire exit doors. And he yeah. says, I even want those lights turned on. You know, I want everything turned on. And they say, but wait a minute, we have to have those in, you know, uh, in case there's a fire, right? You know. And he says, well, if there's a fire, there'll be a small price to pay. You know, they'll they'll have the chance of seeing me come and release this product. His weird kind of arrogance, right? Um, and 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 I kind of probably believe that that may have been because he did have these weird idiosyncrasies, you know, like he he was obsessed against what flash and uh, uh, USB drives for you know installing and downloading from Apple devices, etc. Everything has to go through iTunes if you want to have an, ecolo- uh, an Apple ecology and, and other kinds of things, right? And now. Slowly, you know, Apple is kind of changing because if you, I don't know if you've noticed, but I think the latest uh, uh, iPad Pro, right, has a USB-C port, right? You can just connect something to it and just uh, upload or download from it as if you were you know, connecting to an Intel Windows device. So, you know, slowly waning. It's, it's I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bit, oh. of, um, a bit of interesting <coughs> info. Uh, I was part of uh, the. Um, uh, development team in NEC corporate, um, which were the, basically the first people to start the developments behind USBs. Oh, USBs! So, so you're, you're you're the um, you know the USB. Yeah. yeah, one of the many uh, would have been hundreds of us. So uh, before they came out onto the <coughs> in the industry, I used to have all the specs in front. Of me. Yeah. 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 So, so, so what? Oh, universal serial bus. bus. Yep. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Yeah. And they were, they were so, planned. So like everyone was arguing uh, about the interface, uh, what sort of control lines and all that sort of stuff. And it just took forever. But uh, yeah, I was on that team. Yeah. You know, I think we should make a telly movie about this for next week. Right, it's the origin of USB, right? Starring you. Actually, we'll have somebody else playing you. I don't know who can we get to play you. It has to be somebody that's uh, an NBA basketball player, for example, right? <laughs> somebody that's really tall, for example. Right? I'm trying to think of, you know, very, very tall people in Hollywood at the moment, you know. But it doesn't have to be Hollywood, it could be somebody. It's going back to the world. <laughs> it could be somebody. Could be somebody in the UK. Can we think of a British or French actor? <laughs> Wait a minute, a Bulgarian actor. Medvedev. <laughs> oh, okay. because because I usually have this uh, game that I play in my head. You know, when I meet people, I say, "Ah, oh, yes. If I was casting a, a, a movie, uh, you would be played by X, right? And uh, you know, like Joan. You know Joan, right? Uh, yeah. in, in my mind, Joan would be played by Glenn Close. I don't know, uh, Jack Ryan. 
<laughs> he's not even a character. Even the guy that plays Jack Ryan. Oh, so you want Ilya to be Jack Ryan? Okay. <laughs> so maybe we could have we could have a mashup film, right? So it's Jack Ryan uh, spy thriller, but it's about the origin of USB. Right? And it's more like you know, and it's kind of like in two time period. So the USB uh, was originated when in the 1990s. Oh yeah, we started got in eighty. Was it about eighty six, eighty something like that? We started talking. Yep. That'd be fantastic because you know Netflix like that. It's kind of retro story, you know, because you can have eighties, uh, you know, uh, a rock music on the soundtrack, for example, right? And eighties fashion, right? And then uh, you know, and then because uh, I don't know if people are aware, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and bring it up. Uh, Hall yeah. Oh, yeah. I've got it. I've got it. Wait, I'm bringing it up. I'm bringing it up. Uh, let me... Yeah, good question. Actually, will they actually revolutionise USB? Uh, I'm not I'm sure being... if USB C is that. I don't really know. <clears throat> Because ideally, every everything um, everything in tech is pushing towards being wireless, You're just getting rid of all all sorts of cables. Um, so I I don't know. Do you think Apple will? Do, I think Apple will do its usual, just steal the idea of something. Apple stealing stuff? Oh no! Who would? I mean, there's another uh, movie which we have in the library. A Pirates of the Silicon Valley. It's called Pirates of the Silicon Valley, and it's a, it's a kind of early telly movie, right? And it's a rivalry between Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates, right? And, uh, and there's a kind of made-up scene, uh, I don't know if it ever happened, of uh, Steve Jobs inviting Bill to his luxury apartment, and uh, Steve tells off Bill for stealing windows from the Apple interface, right? And I think the thing, the irony is that Apple Apple uh, stole the idea of the interface from uh, Xerox, you know what I mean? Because Xerox said, oh, come on, Steve, go to the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. And we'll show you the research that we're doing to make photocopiers wonderful, right? And yeah. it's wandering through, you know. I guess photocopiers still jam today, right? They're not doing their job, for example, right? And, uh, and you know, and, oh, by the way, here's a little side project from some goons that are doing something on whatever it's called, a graphical user interface. We go nowhere, for example. And meanwhile, Steve goes, Ka-ching! goes back to the Apple engineers. Yeah. Let's do this, you know? Yeah. And all of a sudden they have the like, Apple like, Lisa. Look what I thought of. <laughs> yeah, it's like, whoa, it's fantastic, right? How are we going to sell it? Let's take a Super Bowl ad, right? Where we kind of, you know, I'm going to try and rip off 1984 and Blade Runner, right? And we'll get that Blade. Uh, this is before Blade Runner. That was actually well, 1984. When did Blade Runner come out? 82, yes. So it was actually after. Uh, the success of Blade Runner and Steve said, oh, let's get that Blade Runner dude, Ridley Scott, he'll do an ad for us, right? And it's more like in the ad we'll make a political statement. You know, it's like Apple's trying to be the underdog and overthrowing the evil empire of Microsoft with this thing called, you know, uh, the Apple Macintosh, right? And then history was made, boom, you know? And uh, and so on and so forth. You know? Don't get me started, right? Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what I'm showing now is uh, an article from... Uh, Guardian uh, about uh, the end of a TV series called Port and Catch Fire, and as it says there, the best show that nobody uh, has watched, right? And it's a, a four seasons that, that's really tech drama, right? And uh, you can, if you Google uh, Port and Catch Fire, you can find clips of it uh, on YouTube, but, and maybe if you dig a little bit deeper, you can find everything, but I can't actually advocate that because it's probably wrong. Uh, but uh, the, the TV series is basically about the origins of modern computing in Silicon Valley, but it's it's totally really weird. And because it's you know a, a cable TV show, right? You know, for I think it was HBO or Showtime in, in America, right? Uh, the rules are you can do anything you want, you can do like anything, but it has to have you know one or both of sex or violence. If it's sex and violence, right, then it's fantastic. You can do anything, right? 
So it's more like in the first episode, um, this guy who wants to have a startup to you know, create a personal computer goes to Stanford, I think, right, and gives a pep talk, you know, to recruit students, right, and uh, and then uh, you know this kind of very talented um, female, you know, I think engineering student that kind of engages in conversation with him during this pep talk. And then all of a sudden, there's a jump cut to both of them doing things that we can't mention in this session. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let, let your imagination wander, for example. Right? And you're kind of wondering, did that really happen? You know? And it's like, maybe, you know, because this is the 1980s, you know, and probably, you know, it could have happened that freely, but it seems like, too, you know, it's more like, oh, yeah, I'm giving a guest lecture somewhere, and all of a sudden, you know, you know, let your imagination wander, you know, half an hour later, for example, that kind of thing. Right? But the thing is, this this um, series, Hawk and Catch Fire, wasn't afraid to actually talk about technical detail. So apart from having sex and little words and so forth, it did actually talk about technical stuff. You know, so uh, once upon a time, who would have thought that anybody would watch something that mentions, you know, Unix and, you know, uh, operating systems and you know all kinds of things. So I'm sure maybe there was an entire episode about USB. I don't know. You, know, you need to look at the episode though. Right? But um, uh, I don't think we have this in in the library. I'm going to see if we can get the library to actually spring for a box set of this well, because I, I think it's really cool. Tell you, um, because um, uh, the USB, the way it really came about was because yeah. people started getting really yeah. sick of. Um, the low speed capacity of RS RS two three two connections. So uh, <clears throat> we started looking at something which could really pump a lot of data, like megabytes, um, in through rather than kilobytes uh, through RS two three two, and that's the way um, yeah. USB came along because we needed really uh, some some kind of interface which could really pump a lot of data through. So RS two three two was just not not happening. It was it wasn't making it. That, that's why USB comes. I think you're making this uh, a discussion session too exciting, you know, with all this talk oh, about you know, RS-322, 232, yeah, but, 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 but just to hit it, the Holt catching fire would have been exactly the same experience. It would have been people just talking technology, crazy ideas, and then said, oh, hey, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Why don't we yeah. create this new bus? Right? Yeah, so everybody started looking at buses, and then universal. Yeah, yeah. So it was just great, great. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that, that movie would have been the same, or the TV series. And, yeah. and what does the term Holt and Catch Fire actually mean? Uh, yeah, well, that's yeah. a good question. Right? Hawk and uh, catch fire. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, uh, catch fire. Um, what catch fire. Uh, why am I bringing up supernatural? Uh, in computer engineering, Hawk and Catch Fire known by the assembly mnemonic HCF is an idiom referring to a computer machine code instruction that causes the computer's central processing unit, CPU, to cease meaningful operation, typically requiring a restart of the computer. It originally referred to a fictitious instruction in the IBM system 360 computer, making a joke about its numerous non-obvious instruction mnemonics. I respect that so even more. That's so obscure, right? That's so obscure. And who in their right mind would A, create a TV series with that kind of title and what network would actually green light it? So I'm saying, right, uh, Ilya, uh, in our yeah. spare time between, you know, I don't know, getting an Nobel Prize and other things, right, try and come up with a series on you know, a telly movie on the origin of US history. I think that's true. That's the instruction you're looking oh. for in an Intel button. Yeah? Oh, so, yeah, okay. A halt instruction. So it was an assembly code. So you basically uh, halted a process and then released to another. But you notice how how early it actually came in. When? Did you come in? Oh, so through the, the, the X4 process, 94. Oh, but, okay. um, oh no, you moved. But have a look. They're, they're like the first hundred megabyte chips, right? And we used to we used to use uh, CPUs like <laughs> the 8080s, like eight, eight kilohertz. 
So, so, so do people still code in assembly? Are there yeah, people well, I, now I have, you know, good I job. Have, yeah, I have. I've, I've uh, with um, with Notepad, you can actually modify uh, Note, yeah. Notepad plus plus. You can actually modify oh. hex code yeah, directly, but that's using have, hex code. We have a not assembly. We have a person. Yeah. Oh, we have a student yeah. in the audience who has actually worked on uh, uh, worked with MS DOS. Yes, excellent. You know, MS DOS. You know, MS DOS is interesting. If you look at the, uh, see, now I'm bleeding into what I do in my other course. See, my other course is, uh, is it uh, designing the user system, designing the user systems experience, right? Yeah. That's what you and, and I have a segment in there where I look at the, the history of, um, you know, interfaces, right? And, yeah. and, I, and I talk a little bit about the origins of uh, MS DOS. And the, the story goes that um, the, the, the reason why MS DOS exists, right, is that IBM decided to get uh, into the personal computing business because they were tightened in terms of mainframes, right? Yeah. And, uh, and if, if, you, if you Google the origins of IBM pieces, right? They just fantastic, like ad campaign with Charlie Chaplin. The kind of you know, uh, I made people aware of this thing called personal computing, right? But what yeah. they needed, uh, yeah. you know, to, to kickstart everything was an operating system, right? And they didn't have one, right? And I think uh, they had set up uh, meetings with a couple of people, and narrowed it down to I think two groups, right? So uh, there was um, uh, a one group with a guy called Dr. Gary Kildall, and Dr. Gary Kildall with something called CPM. Uh, CPM. I don't know what the acronym CPM is for, right? But in retrospect, uh, IT historians say that a CPM is actually anything, you know, uh, in MS DOS land, for example. But I think there's probably like CPM emulators that you can find online. But apparently, Kildall. Uh, couldn't make it to the meeting with the IBM reps, etc., whatever, right? Uh, and they saw Bill Gates first, right? Yeah. And I think uh, this was when uh, Bill had just... I saw, he, he left, dropped out at Harvard University. And, oh, students, if you want to be successes in the world, right, just, just kind of study hard and, and get into a Harvard and then drop out, you know, after a year or two, right? And then you'll become a gazillionaire. You know, it worked for uh, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. It may also work for you, you know? But, you know, you can do the same thing here at RMIT as well. So preferably finish a course first, like, like these ones that you're doing now. Um, ah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, CP, uh, and and uh, uh, Bill met with the IBM rep, right? And then uh, and they said, okay, uh uh, we like your style, we like your story, right? Uh, we'll give you, um, you know, uh, the, the contract, right? The only problem yeah. was they didn't have ships, right? Nothing, right? <laughs> so then uh, Bill and Paul Allen said, oh, what are we going to do, right? And then there was, uh, they found some guy, right, that was like door knocking around for a job. I think it was Dave Patterson, right? A guy called Dave Patterson. And Dave Patterson had something called QDOPS because he had quick and dirty operating system, right? Quick and dirty. Uh, and they thought, oh, shit, this is great. We need it because we have to show IBM something by next week. We'll take it, right? And it will make you employee number, whatever, that kind of thing, right? Uh, thanks very much, you know? And they said, here, quick and And then it becomes NSOS, and, and the rest is history, right? And it's more like, then you know, a lot of people would say, well, uh, but how come Dave Patterson kind of obscure it in the history of, you know, Microsoft or, you know, uh, IT in general, but I don't think Dave actually cares much because he, he's like employee number, what, nine or ten or something at Microsoft, and he's got a huge number of shares in Microsoft, so it's more like he do not care, right, it's more like, you know, he doesn't have to worry about anything ever, you know, it's like, you know, um, and it's, you know, history books don't say that I'm responsible for Microsoft's greatness, etc., right? And, and even, you know, the greatness of Microsoft, it kind of has, you know, it's fallen out of favor and it's come back. Um, yeah. uh, and I think for, for a while it was kind of, you know, lingering and not doing anything exciting. And now I think it's back and I think it's in part as due to the new CEO, yeah. whatever his name is. Uh, uh, and, 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 and also the uh, Surface Pro, I think, you know. Or, uh, as a Microsoft Surface is kind of taken off. You know, so, 
they've kind of uh, revived themselves. Uh, ah. Uh, where were we? Uh, I think we're back to. Did I hear? No, I'm hearing it now, but I'm trying to. If we just wander through this uh, very quickly before we forget. Uh, uh, a privacy perspective. Oh no. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Sorry. I'm sharing the wrong thing. Sorry. But too many things. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, there it is. I've got it. Yeah. No, I've got it. I've got it. Yeah. Uh, there it is. That's, that's the one. Yeah. Um, privacy perspective on contact tracing as a. a a pandemic uh, response. Uh, flattening the curve helps protect privacy too. Uh, so people are responding to a variety of ethical issues raised by current efforts to collect and share personal data for contact tracing amongst individuals in the hope of helping to curb the spread of coronavirus. Some of those issues are related to privacy but also to effectiveness, fairness and more. And I think uh, a lot of those things, like fairness in particular, would be an ethical issue. But privacy, I think, is a is very much an ethical issue as well. Uh, and uh, and if you listen to the audio seminar, I try to kind of mumble through uh, my reasons for why uh, privacy is important. Because some psychologists or anthropologists would say uh, privacy is important in life if you want to establish intimacy with people. Because yeah, privacy is about selectively revealing information about ourselves and um, one anecdote that I don't I didn't put into the audio seminar was imagine if humans were actually born with the ability to read people's minds and I think that most people would think that if you can read people's minds you can switch it on or off but I think if people did have the ability to read minds it would be something that we wouldn't be able to control uh, and that would mean that you know we'd be kind of driven uh, to states of anxiety because every time we come into contact with a group of people, we'd be flooded with their thoughts, you know, all their inane thoughts about you know uh, dreams, hopes, and aspirations, and what they want for breakfast, for example. And um, if you if you want a good sci-fi film that kind of illustrates this uh, as an example, it's a uh, scanner. Have you seen Scanners, um, directed by David Cronenberg? It's one of his Canadian uh, director David Cronenberg. And Scanners is like a, a, a classic kind of gory sci-fi film uh, about uh, a, a U.S. military project, of course, to genetically engineer people to be able to read minds, obviously for you know, conflict and espionage reasons, right? And the and the, the thing is, when people have this ability in this film, right, they can't switch it off, you know. And uh, what happens is that um, the military gives them these drugs to actually kind of lower their ability to actually read people's minds. And some of the people, right, that have this ability to scan people's minds can also influence other people's thoughts, right. And uh, the famous scene in the film, of course, is the one where the, the scanner rebels and escapes, right, and uh, uses his powers to actually make somebody's head explode, right? and you see that some gory dudes up, right? Um, it's a classic scene, you know. But, uh, but one of the scanners in the story actually uh, escapes from his kind of uh, U.S. military prison, right, and uh, ends up in a, in a shopping mall, right? And he's kind of wandering through the shopping mall, kind of, you know, and his head's going to explode as well, because he's just kind of hearing everybody's thoughts and, you know, I hate this and I want to have this and so that kind of thing, right? Um, and, 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 and I always think, well, imagine if humans could actually read people's minds, but not be able to actually make other people's heads blow up, because that would be a bad thing, right? Uh, and, and I think uh, if, if people could read other people's minds, it would mean that we, as a species, would probably have never evolved language, you know? Because uh, a language is the way kind of humans communicate, you know, either through writing or speech and that kind of thing. Right? And I think m maybe, and here's me speculating on the fly now, 
if we would have had the ability to read minds, then maybe we wouldn't be living in the sophisticated world that we're in now. Because I think with language, you know, first it comes speech, right? And then speech turns into writing, right? A writing is kind of displaced thought, which means we, it adds to our capacity to uh, engage in abstractions. Abstract means we can think in a more analytical, creative way. Uh, and then, of course, the rest is history. If we'd have just been a species that could lead other people's lives, we would probably be, uh, I don't know, dolphins or crows, probably. I, I don't know. And and who knows, you know? Uh, do dolphins actually read each other's minds? Do whales re uh, read each other's minds? We don't know. We're not dolphins or whales. Anyway. Hey, Ilya, you there? Ilya? Ilya? Yes, yes, yes. yes Ilya? Sorry, yes, sorry, sorry. sorry I, thought I lost you. Right? No, no, no. No, I was just speculating there. I don't know. Oh, 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 what do you think about my crazy speculation? No, that it, dolphins I, I, and whales maybe can read each other's minds. I was, I was trying to um, uh, look at things like this. <clears throat> How do you communicate without words? Oh, non-verbal communication. Okay. Yeah. But don't most people actually do that anyway? Like, you know, uh, yeah. you could be talking to somebody, right? But your facial expression gives another message. Yeah. Or maybe you use a gesture when you're communicating, like, you know, um, yeah. you know, like, I mean, the big joke is, right, if you don't understand um, a foreign language, how can you be sure if somebody is actually uh, talking to you nicely or if they're not swearing in their, in, in <laughs> Bulgaria, say, for example, you're swearing at me in Bulgaria, for example, right, but you've got a smile on your face, right, as you're doing it, you know what I mean? So it's like you look really like an angel, right? But you're totally vulgar and really <laughs> bad in your words, right? But you're talking about Bulgarian. I can't understand Bulgarian, right? So I don't... Because the thing is, when you're actually, say, swearing in a language, right? The other the other thing that adds to the communicative power of language is you know, paralanguage, is your vocal intonation. Because when people swear, right? They would maybe, like, raise their voice, for example, you know? But like nobody would swear at somebody in a kind of sing-song way, you know, like you're singing "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star." It yeah. doesn't make sense, you know. What I mean? So yeah, there's kind of that aggressive anger component to um, swearing, which is also kind of a, a parallel language as well. You know? um, oh, can I can I just digre I, I'll, I'll divert and stuff? Just move on. Please, please digress and because I think we're totally we're yeah. we're so digress now that you I, know, I, um, I, we're kind of in a spiral. Yeah, I have to tell you an interesting one because I was communicating with one of my cousins, which been, they've been looking for me for nearly 15 years, and they finally found me. Right? Um, what, yeah. hang on, what was the comment there? Uh, they only found me. Oh, yeah. um, what, no, what yes, thing, yes, I correct. Think, uh, you yeah. need the whole yeah, because I think it's, I, I agree as well because I think a lot of times when people listen to songs, for example, do you actually completely understand the meaning of the song? Right, because most people just maybe appreciate the, the kind of melody and the rhythm and the harmony, etc. But, but the actual uh, semantics of the song are often overlooked, you know. Uh, and, and even, like, if you're, if you're a fan of opera, for example, right, uh, often like opera might be in German or Italian, right, for example, right? And then if you can't speak those languages, right, in, in an opera theatre, they would put subtitles. You know, so, but then again, most people would say, why am I reading the subtitles? I'm here for the, uh, the, the sonic experience, right? Um, and, and that's what I'm thinking of, like, well, why don't we as educators actually sing a business ethics for digital society? Um, it, it, it kind of might not work because, you know, uh, we, we probably would need to get better production teams in and maybe a better cast, for example. We have a musical, I think. No, that, that's, that's my goal. Business ethics for a digital society is a musical. For example, like Frozen, for example. Right? Same. Your your uh, friend. Uh, uh, two points. Two points, right? First, first point is um, uh, yeah. the miscommunication. Miscommunication can be really awful, right? And I'll just give you an example. Really funny thing happened. Uh, yeah, the yeah. cousin, cousin, which um, uh, one of my cousins, which uh, has been looking yeah. for for about fifteen years, finally found me, right? And um, yeah. <coughs> emailed me from Bulgaria. And um, I, I thought, I'll do the smart thing and I'll just write my whole uh, response in English and then put it through Google Translator. So I put it through yep. Google Translator 
and without checking, right, I just copy pasted my response, and then I didn't yeah. get a response for like three days, right? Like three days into yeah. it, no response. And I thought, yeah. I wonder what, why I haven't received a response yet, right? So I thought, I'll yeah. go back and check the email that I sent. So I did a cut, cut and paste back into Google Translate to do a reverse translation, right? And the translation yeah, yeah. came back. The original original text was, "You're looking really great. Seems like you you use a lot of makeup, like when I was back there, blah blah blah, like this sort of thing, right?" It just you know, <laughs> and, um, yeah. and uh, the translation. When I actually put the translation back in, the English version came back saying, "You're looking really great. Heaps of makeup. You know, a lot of makeup. Hope you blow up." <laughs> 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 I immediately jumped onto the uh, and said, "Oh, sorry, sorry." You know, oh. right, so miscommunication <laughs> can be a really bad thing, right? Now, uh, so, okay. <laughs> so I thought, uh, uh, "Charles, I'll get auditioning for scammers." <laughs> Oh, is he true? I, I felt so guilty. I really did. I thought oh, I'll, I'll jump in an aeroplane and you personally go over there to say sorry. But, but anyway. You didn't, you didn't want to use Google Translate again in case you didn't stop it even more. <laughs> like, I'm sorry that I said that and it was translated. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you mate with a shark. Yeah, it's so important. <laughs> right. So even body language, right? So even body language. Yeah. Uh, if you put, yeah. uh, let's say, uh, that's this is where I'm coming from. Is my next next thing that I want yeah. to talk about is, yeah. is uh, yeah, yeah. we um, <laughs> we invent a new communication channel. So, in other words, at the moment, yeah. uh, communication is verbal, right? So we have a we yeah, have basically yeah. a, a USB cable which we connect between each other with sound goes through, right? We have another USB cable which is visual. So where is our USB port, do you? So I'm just wondering where it is. I can't find one, right? <laughs> they have to have one physically inserted. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the interface must be really careful. <laughs> but but um, so we have all these communication going. So we have all these cables, right? Um, and to a, yeah, to a yeah. point where we even have feelings, right? Touch and so forth. So all these cables wow, connected yeah. between each other. Now, um, what's stopping us? In the future, another cable, but that cable is pure, like we're talking about thought, right? So a communication, a communication to actually just be able to think to each other rather than visually look, you know, all this sort of stuff. It it, it could happen, right? Uh, it was the yeah. same where she goes to Paris. What was that? And then we were in the Paris Oh, oh, okay, yes, yes. Well, once again, it's like, you know, uh, if you're trying to order something from a menu and you don't know what it is, you know, um, you have to look and see what that is. Oh, what is that? Kanga. Oh, this is good. What is it? Oh, fish heads. Oh, no. Is it alive? <laughs> oh, no. In Japan, the uh, fish still uh, breathing. Really? I like it. Okay. So, what do you talk to it? All the way from the bottom, all the way to the tail. But the oh, head's still. Okay. <laughs> 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 see, I see. In terms of code of conduct in a restaurant, right? One can never vomit in a restaurant. Vegetarian, that's it. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. No such thing as vegetarian. And all the terrorists take you. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, oh, please. <laughs> oh, that's that was really? great. oh, yeah, you were talking about uh, a, a USB connectors for thought. Does that mean we need to get an upgrade? Oh, no, probably not. I mean, um, 
what what is the future, right? Uh, so, um, oh, okay, okay. Actually, you made me think about something. Right? Okay, um, uh, if we come up with AI, you know, like robots, plants, intelligent robots, then the robots would probably also be. Oh, can you plug in the newspaper? Oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, um, uh, it's like, you know, but you know, the, that's the thing. It's like, or, oh, we have some kind of computer that takes over the world, but right? then we just have to have some person that puts the PowerPoint and plug it, right? you know, and that's it, right? And, and the thing is, but there's a there's a classic uh, film. I don't know if you've seen it, Ilya, called uh, The Forbin Project. It's called Colossus: The Forbin Project. And it was made in the uh, uh, 1970s, right? and it's based on a trilogy of science fiction novels by D.F. Jones uh, about a computer called Colossus. So the U.S. built this uh, a, a, a supercomputer that's artificially intelligent, right? and surprise, surprise, the military gets it to control the intercontinental ballistic, uh, ballistic missiles yeah. in the U.S., right? Uh, and But at the start of the movie, right, People don't say, oh, it's a computer, somebody can just unplug it to try to take over the world. They have this sequence to where the kind of inventor or the architect of Colossus, right, um, launches the computer, right, and it's actually built in a mountain, you know, so huge yeah. computers, like the size of a mountain, right? but you kind of see that it's got its own nuclear reactor and it's got like a solar energy backup and that kind of thing, and it's sealed behind, you know, great big thick. Uh, iron doors, so it can't be, you know, uh, that's the one, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that way, you know, people can't say, oh, it's just a computer, it's, it, where's the off switch? But if you want a, an intelligent, uh, prophetic film about AI, uh, then you can watch uh, The Problem Project, uh, which is, there's clips of it in uh, on YouTube, of course, but uh, the thing is, uh, how it takes over the world is interesting because it controls the inter intercontinental ballistic missile. So then basically, it can hold the world to ransom. So it's more like, you know, hey, you've got to do this for me, or otherwise I'll destroy New York. And they said, oh, well, we don't believe you. And it does. It launches a missile and destroys New York, except for that kind of thing. You know? And then the thing, how it actually takes over the world is it actually uh, finds out that the uh, USSR created uh, a competing AI that's controlling their intercontinental business control. And uh, the, the American computer, Colossus, establishes a link with that, and basically that's how um, it takes over the world. You know? And I think it was it was always meant to be part of the trilogy, but they never actually uh, finished it. Uh, because I think uh, in the trilogy, I think, uh, you know, humans basically um, a win back the planet. What you know? So it's more positive. But I think uh, probably, even as I, even as we speak now, and probably if they didn't have this thing called coronavirus, uh, I'm sure that Hollywood would be kind of working on this as a, as either um, a movie or a, probably most definitely it would work as a Netflix series. I, I can see this as a Netflix series very much. Have you seen? Uh, I haven't seen. It. No, you should. To do. Because there's a there's a scene in the film where uh, uh, you know uh, the guy that you're seeing there uh, in front of the machine is um, the actor Eric Braden, uh, who's still working. I think he's in Hollywood uh, on a soap opera called Day, uh, Young and the Restless, right? And uh, and um, and and Doctor Foreman, right? The character that he plays, right? Um, the the computer decides to you know treat him nicely because he's basically the father of of him, etc. Right? Uh, yeah. and, and he kind of uh, tries to have a plot, you know, uh, like an underground plot to overthrow the AI, right? And it, but he kind of needs to find private time when he's not being spied on by Colossus, right? So he kind of makes up a story that, you know, he's a, he's a human male, right? So he needs to engage in sexual activity on a regular basis, otherwise he would suffer, you know, uh, a mental health episodes, right? And he says, "Well, just search through your memory banks, and you'll yeah. find this true." So basically, uh, the uh, the AI says, "Sure, you can do that." So I'll let you have some time, you know, uh, and, and you could, you know, you know, have, have sexual activity with you. 
And then, but the thing is, right, uh, uh, well, you have to be completely naked when you go into a room, so you're not kind of bringing any uh, devices and whatever that kind of thing. But, and, and I thought it was really clever in that respect, those little touches they have in the film, you know. So it should be your to-do list. Ah, oh, hack a hero. I have feedback. Okay, neuro feedback. Okay. You know, I remember I was, talking, I was talking to you about the yeah. cables and fast. Well, they're on. They're on the right track. They're already starting to look into it. Yeah. So they're actually going to have devices. Uh, yeah, we can sell the products. Oh, that's interesting. That's Hamza Benajali, the Algerian hacker hero. Yeah. Hamza Ben uh, Ben Dalajari will be sentenced after allegedly stealing from U.S. banks and giving to Palestinian. Charities. That sounds like a digital Robin Hood. You know, you know uh, Robin Hood, the legendary uh, British dude that you know uh, mm -hmm. robbed from the rich and uh, stopped, uh, gave to the poor, you know? as opposed to uh, other people in the 21st century that do the opposite. You know, uh, you know? rob from the poor, steal from the rich. Do you, Do you think that uh, that that's right, Ilya? What he's doing, but it's certainly revolutionary. He's not following. He's not following rules in the Kantian sense, I think, you know, because yeah. uh, you know, in Kantian sense, there's certain duties. Like a, you know, even even if banks are the devil incarnate, right? Yeah. They're still protected by you know laws enacted by Parliament, and Parliament is there, uh, you know, as a social contract or a government contract, etc. Um, and, and perhaps that outweighs, you know, uh, in X, unless, you know, it's, it's part of a deeper kind of uh, series of, um, I guess, misgivings. Uh, because the thing is, right, if, if I had a, a, a colleague once, right, who said, why are you interested in ethics, John? Because, you know, all you have to do is have like a totalitarian regime take us over. And, and all your ethics is flipped on its head. You know, he was kind of thinking more like, you know, uh, imagine you were living in the uh, Roman Empire, for example. So you're in the Roman Empire, right? And if you're not yeah. a Roman citizen, right, uh, yeah. then basically your life is smelly brown stuff, for example, right? Because, you know, you're a barbarian, you're a slave, for example, that kind of thing, right? And it's then true. fast forward... Even being a Roman, uh, part of the Roman Empire, there was only a select few that were like pure blood. Like, so everyone else in the Roman Empire were just slaves and <coughs> you know, so forth anyway, through history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but I've got to answer your question. I, I must answer your question. Um, this guy is... Which question? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Know, do you think it's right or not? So this guy here is stealing from banks, right? But banks, we're yeah, yeah, yeah. That banks are rich people. What if... I'll just give you a scenario. What if... Um, there was an old lady, her pension goes into that bank account and she lives on like bare minimum and he comes along and takes that bare minimum away. And that lady yeah, yeah, yeah. comes yeah. a burden on society than the pa Palestinian charities. So he flips, yeah, yeah. flips the coin. <clears throat> so how did yeah. he judge, judge that sort of scenario? I don't know. <clears throat> hard, well, hard I, I think the problem uh, uh, the problem is the complexity of the society uh, that we're living in now. Uh, and I think no one person has the wisdom to know how everything would work out if they perform certain acts which they think are righteous. You know? Because uh, in sociology, there's a concept called the law of unintended consequences. Right? And often when you do something, then there are unintended consequences. And the unintended consequences could be positive or negative. So one example of uh, positive unintended consequences is some uh, group of researchers were working on uh, heart medication and it didn't work. But later they figured out uh, that it did work in other areas of the body and that this led to the development of a drug called Viagra. And I won't kind of... <laughs> outline this further because we're derated at the moment you know? but that's unintended consequences so nobody kind of sat down and said oh I, uh, we're going to have you know billions of dollars to try and work out how we can solve problem X you know and then come up with something uh, called Viagra so Viagra is kind of an accidental 
uh, innovation, you know, and, and I could keep on going uh, on with this, like post-it notes, for example. So 3M were looking for a super glue, it didn't work. And then somebody said, let's put it on the back of little pieces of yellow paper, and we have post-it notes, you know. So uh, there's those kind of um, accidental innovations, which are the result of, um, you know, the law of unintended consequences, and that those are positive uh, side effects. But the negative side effects would be, oh, and this goes on, like, you know, DDT, I think, in the 60s, which was a, a pesticide, right? And, and the side effects of that were legendary, which are kind of like... Uh, birth defects in, uh, in newborns and so forth, and that kind of thing. And eventually DDT was, was banned, you know. Um, and, and so there's kind of, um, you know, uh, side effects, which could be positive or negative with anything that you do. And as life becomes uh, even more complex, then we don't have the godlike wisdom to actually be able to predict what... Uh, uh, the future is going to be like. But if you do have this thing called ethic, right, and I'm trying to plug what we're doing now, right, then it le at least gives you a sense of tools to think in a different way about things. Because when you're thinking about things in life, right, it could be to solve problems. You know, how can we, you know, uh, cure cancer, for example, or how can we uh, come up with a, a vaccine or a cure for COVID-19? Um, and then people might say, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's a good thing to do, to come up with a vaccine. That's an excellent thing to do, to come up with a vaccine or a cure for COVID-19. But we have to be careful in how we approach that, because if we do things the wrong way, then the consequences could be even worse. You know, like, uh, what's that drug that um, Donald Trump was... Um... Hey, no, Ilya, are you there? I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, my internet dropped off. Oh. Oh, okay. I was just I was just blurbing about uh, the drug that Donald Trump was. Um, oh yes, yeah, so hydro, yeah. hydro. The one that Melbourne. Uh, Hydroquinone. Yeah. Was it Melbourne Union? Did you say guy Clive? Yeah. Oh, no, Clive Palmer said that he brought up you know lots yeah. and lots of that hydroquinone, whatever that kind of thing, right, and put an ad in the paper for it. Yeah, and that's been kind of discredited because people said that was well, some people when they take that it's damaging to their you know hearts, for example. You know, so uh, in other words, through acts of desperation, in the climate that we're in, some people can you know be experimenting or take cures for COVID nineteen. It can lead to even worse consequences. Ah, use in dengue treatment. Ah, yes, yeah, because uh, that um, hydro. Um, uh, hydro, 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 yeah. hydro, hydro, yeah. so hydro, 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 it's an anti-malaria. Uh, so, uh, uh, just oh, you got it. You're faster than me. Yeah. Um, Trump touts hydroxychloroquine <laughs> as a cure for COVID-19. Don't believe the hype. The anti-malaria drug uh, could be one of the biggest game changers. Trump claimed that there's no magic cure. And of course, last week Trump put his foot and most of his leg into his mouth. Uh, because he said something like, what, injecting yourself with detergents or disinfectants, or, I don't know, cooking oil, for example, is a cure for, um, that kind of thing, right? And then, like, there's been side effects in the media about that, saying, well, you know, uh, maybe some people shouldn't be talking outside of their area of expertise, you know? Um, because otherwise, you know, he might say things like, well, we can cure COVID-19 by cold compresses or drinking lots of, you know, chicken soup, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and people uh, often now, you know, when they kind of discount things that, you know, oh, patients in India treated through this, my friend, doctor, oh. there told me, and is, so, I don't know, maybe it, it might work, you know. But I think probably uh, the thing is it might work for some people, but not for all people. You know? 
but I think maybe that would be even true with a vaccine. If somebody comes up with a vaccine, like for example, if you go and get uh, the vaccine for influenza, for example, they're not just going to give it to you willy nilly. They'll ask you all these questions, you know, like, are you allergic to eggs? You know, uh, have you had uh, you know allergic reactions in the past? You know, have you had influenza vaccine? But because you know uh, people are different. You know, so even things that are supposedly safe, right, could harm some people. You know, not not you know catastrophic harm, but you know some harm. You know, and it's true with any medicine. You know, so and a lot of times, uh, companies that do produce these drugs or vaccines or whatever are just doing this so that they can avoid uh, litigation, being sued, etc. Hustle nowadays in the 21st century. You know, that's the that's the side effect of you know being. A universe where you know we have this thing called business. You know? uh, if we were living in prehistoric times, you know, we'd just go to our witch doctor and say, you know, there's this thing called coronavirus. You know? Ah, an irony without uh, any reaction. You'll never know. Oh yeah, yeah, you never know what you're allergic. Yes, yeah, true. Because people might say, are you allergic to this? And it's more like, no, I'm allergic, allergic to Zoom, for example, or Microsoft Teams, right? Uh, you know. But, uh, but I'm not allergic to you know, a collaborate ultra. It, it, my body seems to tolerate it, you know, that kind of thing, you know. So I, I'm waiting for people to have digital allergies, you know. What are you allergic to, Ilya? You know, I, you know, I can't find that, um, uh, remember the UV light, which actually had the UVA, UVB. Oh, UVA. yeah, UV light, yes, I yes. just cannot find that. Because um, I was listening. Light. Because that, that was one of the things that Trump was no. talking about, and he got misrepresented in the yeah, um, yeah. in the news, saying, "Oh, you know, insert these things," because he didn't know how to explain technical things. He's, he's a business guy, not an IT guy. Um, and uh, when he explained it, all the news articles were, "Oh, this guy's gone crazy. He's talking about you know inserting you know all these lights in in bodies, right?" But uh, there's actually I can't, I can't find the link. It's a it's an actual company oh, called a, Healthy Com Light or something. Health, Health Light, Healthy Light. Content search light. Content yeah. search light. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I'm pretty sure it's called Healthy Light. Or oh, wait a minute. Oh, no, I, I, I found I found something interesting. I'll, I'll show you. UVA. This is something actually really. Uh, since we're talking about the Donald. Can't find it. Guys. Trump explains his dis distinctive orange hue. It's the light bulb. <laughs> the people always said, why is it that you look so orange? And, uh, and it's, 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 not, it's not me. It's my, you know, it's, it's the way they lie to me. Right? Uh, so I don't really look like a, a Valencia orange. <laughs> so, so in other words, right? It's interesting how people will do anything to criticise him. It's like, we don't like him because he's orange. You just have to use personal attack. <laughs> well, I don't know, is there a word for you know, discrimination against colour? It's like, you know, colorism, you know, etc. Not even racism, you know. I don't like you because you're I, orange. I can't, can't, find, can't find it for life. Um, the UV Maybe line. if we, uh, oh no, uh, no, I did. That's right, that's right, that's right. Trump, uh, Trump inserts, like, <laughs> just thinking about it, it was a newspaper cartoon. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, you really, you really, uh, like this, um, article, because it comes from a, a, uh, a journal that I think you, uh, often read, uh, do you? It's called, uh, Reason. I, I don't think you'd read Reason because a Reason is from the um, rapid, uh, not right in the uh, US. There it is, yeah. Um, it's not fake news. Trump did actually suggest that injecting bleach. Ah, okay, so that's the bleach one. But I don't think that one says anything about the light. I'm trying to see. Uh, uh, so I found, uh, found the article where he's been misrepresented. <coughs> <coughs> is that the same one? Is insert light? What is it? No, this one's just talking about the bleach. The bleach. I think oh, it sorry, says yeah. that 
Uh, yeah, it'll kill the virus in five minutes, but isopropyl alcohol will kill the virus in 30 seconds. Um, and I wonder why Trump didn't say, why don't you just uh, inject uh, Jack Daniels into your vein? Intravenous Jack Daniels, for example, right? Um, but, uh, that, that article yeah, from, from Melbourne University. Yeah, I know, because that was a Yeah. They, they were actually, um, they were doing exactly that. Right. No, 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 it's, it's there. I think it's it's there. There's a quote there. I asked Bill a question that probably some of you are thinking. If you're totally into that world, which I find to be very interesting. So supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, whether it's ultraviolet or just a very powerful light, and I yeah. think you said that that has been checked, but you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you yeah. can do either through the skin or in some other way. And I think you're going to test that too. It sounds interesting, right? And uh, when he was doing this at that um, you know, uh, press conference or you know, with the journalists, right, it looked like he was talking to people behind him because he had the Medico Supremos there. But then everybody that was commenting on that was saying, that's, that's all BS because he's, he's making it look like he's talking with them and they're responding, but they're not because they probably all have you know, the look of stun mullets on their faces, you know, when Trump is saying it, but he's kind of using his acting talent to make it look like they're kind of agreeing or backing him up because the camera never shows their responses because it's always focusing on Trump saying it. So. Yeah. But yeah. this notion of light, I think there is some validity maybe to it. I mean, I wouldn't say, ah, oh, look at this person on his Instagram, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, light is, is, is not a, a powerful thing in our lives, right? Because we're creatures that are born on a planet with, you know, UV light that comes from the sun. So the sun is instrumental in creating environments, life, and so forth, that kind of thing. You know, so it's not out of question to say that maybe, you know, light, certain kinds of light may have, you know, curative properties against certain diseases. I mean, like, even I was listening to a um, doctor last night. Uh, talking about uh, the the lockdown that we're in, you know, and, and saying that maybe we should be uh, free to actually be because if we're exposed to UV light from the sun, uh, coronavirus doesn't like that, you know. So he was kind of saying, you know, UV light, you know, is kind of you know that does harm to the virus, for example. But I'm not sure he actually said that we should pump it, you know, into our bodies. Maybe that's a little bit extreme, but you know. Um, but the thing is, people, you know, uh, have uh, all kinds of therapies using, uh, you know, infrared light. So infrared uh, lights are used to treat, say, rheumatic pain, for example, right? Uh, and that's a kind of light, you know, called the electromagnetic spectrum. So, you know, we can't completely, you know, condemn what the Donald says. It's just that maybe the way he says it, you know, he should be a little bit more restrained. Sometimes I think he's a little bit too excited. It's more like, oh, I heard that, you know, if you actually, you know, chew gum can, you know, make you richer or something like that. You know? No, I just cannot um, follow that, um, that, that uh, art dog product. Well, 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 well you know, they do use it now in surgery. They, they put it down for you know, your homework. Yeah, I just cannot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I oh, cannot. I'll, I'll tell you another place. I'll tell you another place where light is actually used. Most people have been to a dentist, right? And often when you go to a dentist now, they give you a filling, right? In order to cure the substance they put into the filling, they use UV light. So there's actually, that's why they give you those glasses. They give you like sunglasses, not just to protect yep. eyes and face from debris, but also to shield you from the UV because uh, they'll stick in a, a little UV lamp, right? It cures the filling and voila, you know, it doesn't fall out straight away only six months later, so you can come back and get return service, so that the dentist can buy another BMW, or whatever fancy car he doesn't want to just a few. Um, because, because my dentist was saying, like, we're sorry, because of the lockdown, you can't come to see us, unless you have these conditions, and all of a sudden, the lockdown is kind of easy, it says, yippee, you can come back now, right? Get the things clean, training and everything. What are the other things? I need to get another uh, fancy car. What's the fancy car? I don't know. I need a Volkswagen. 
<laughs> a new condition like <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, I think maybe we'll, I, I want to actually wrap this up. Uh, but soon. But maybe Ilya, for your homework, if you can try and find the article about that light source, when you find it, you can uh, email the link to me, or actually post it up at the bottom of the um, coronavirus corner. Uh, it's, it's actually not an article, and, it's an actual uh, product. It's an actual product. It, were, it was released like a month before Donald Trump started uh, talking about it. Then he got mocked by it, by what? everyone. But, but it's an actual UV light treatment. It's 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 available. <coughs> so, talking about it without knowing all the background to it. <laughs> it's been silly. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. what, I mean, especially... Kind of maybe hold off. Make sure of your facts oh, first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, academics, we don't have to do that. We just blurt things out. No, no, actually, we actually fact check everything. Everything is rigidly fact checked. <laughs> Reference, of course. Uh, let's let's um, let's just go through. Uh, bits. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just reading. I lost the article. Okay, uh, we're looking at that article. Yep. Uh, broadly in the US, responses seem to fall uh, four categories. With respect to um, the, the issue of uh, uh, contact tracing, and I think the four categories are privacy advocates who see this as an exceptional time challenge, uh, the rebalancing of the trade offs, and who argue that contact tracing is necessary and useful, not instead of, but in addition to social distancing and other measures. And, it has to be done, even if that would require enabling legislation, right? And, and there's a link to an article, we need a mass surveillance program, right? And I think, and, and most people, when they hear term surveillance, they would think, oh, this is a bad thing, it's the government or business spying on us. But in this case, it's a surveillance for the greater good, so utilitarianism, for the greater good, for the greater number. And I think it's more like, you know, uh, balancing things out. If we have a super threat, like coronavirus, for example, and uh, it, it can harm the, the, the frail, frail in our society and, 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 and kill them, then it's a really bad thing. Uh, and, and so maybe, you know, there's a kind of positive aspect, even if we have trade-ups for uh, privacy, as it says in point one. Point two, privacy advocates who believe that technology should play a, a role, but who are working on technical protocols that would keep uh, the governments and other actors from identifying individuals using data for other purposes or keeping the data indefinitely. In other words, this group is not arguing for a rewrite of the law and not relying on legal protection. So in other words, it's saying, well, let's, um, you know, uh, tracing will actually try and increase uh, the privacy aspects of the technology. Uh, this reminds me of an article that I read in New Scientist once saying that the Oh, a big advance in privacy technology actually came from uh, people who, surprise, surprise, uh, distribute uh, pornography. You know, because people that consume pornography obviously don't want, uh, uh, you know, the, the use of the sites and, and products actually uh, made common knowledge. You know, so privacy is a paramount concern for them. Um, number three, uh, privacy advocates. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Privacy advocates who argue that the uh, potential harms of contact tracing are too great and will likely accrue unfairly to the most vulnerable populations, that the data collector will always be partial and unbalanced, and that the potential benefits don't justify the potential long-term destruction of privacy. So in other words, these are the people that are saying, no, 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 we don't agree with this because uh, the, the, the data that's gathered may be biased. And, and also uh, there'll be too much impact on, on, on uh, privacy for citizens, for example. And this notion of bias and data is interesting because if you look at, say, a people's love affair with big data or big data, you know, how you pronounce it, you will say big data is great, you know, but is it great for everyone? Because some people argue there's a bias in big data. Because in the last week we looked at the digital divide. So the, the digital haves, right, their information would be represented in big data, not so much the have-nots. So if people use big data to make policy decisions, it could work against the have-nots. You know, it's like saying, you know, 
um, IT, the internet's fantastic, you know. The people that have it already, if you improve it, but if people have uh, access to minimal IT, internet, and so forth, right, then uh, they're always going to be sidelined. Um, and there's a, a link, I think, on point three to an article called Privacy is Not an Abstraction. Because sometimes people talk about privacy in the abstract, when, like, in the audio seminar, I try and liken privacy to an emotion, like a feeling. People have a feeling about privacy. People have a feeling about security. So it's not just something that, you know, is is, is a manifestation of technology. Uh, number four, on the last point, uh, privacy advocates who argue that we don't yet have enough evidence to know whether the contact tracing will work as suggested, and that in the absence of such evidence, the known harms that way, the unproven benefit. So, once again, that's like a utilitarian analysis there. It's more like, how can we be sure that contact tracing will work? How can we be sure that the COVID-19 safety app federal government is advocating will work, right? They're just saying, well, you know, almost like an act of desperation. Hey, this might work. And then, then the law of unintended consequences could kick in and something else happens. And there's a, a link to an article under point four. Uh, for an example of this perspective, see location tracking to fight coronavirus is dangerous and possibly pointless. So obviously some person who has a negative opinion of coronavirus tracking. In this context, note the example of Singapore, which has been generally touted for the effective, effectiveness of its contact tracing, but has had to return to lockdown. Aha! So obviously, maybe they are saying that in Singapore, they initially seemed to think, we have beaten coronavirus because we used contact tracing, they released the restrictions, it came back with a vengeance. Now they're under a kind of more severe lockdown. An article in the Strait Times updated on April the 8th quotes the Prime Minister of Singapore as noting, despite our good contact tracing for nearly half of the new cases, we do not know where or from whom the person caught the virus. And that's because often probably sometimes people do things to subvert what they think uh, may involve tracing of where they are because maybe sometimes people just don't want to make public where they are. Somebody's having an illicit affair with somebody. Like you may be having an affair with somebody, right? Uh, and probably, there's no kind of law against that. There may be a moral law, for example. But you may be high, uh, wanting to potentially hide any trace of this from your partner uh, and maybe that then you may kind of set certain conditions or whatever in, in tracking devices that you have to make sure that you know you can't possibly be caught out in the future that's just me being paranoid um, and uh, I want to say the article cited above were written at, at different points in the trajectory of the pandemic although three of them were written within weeks or days of each other days make a big difference in this debate realities change new data emerges ethical analysis shifts too. Ah, interesting point there. Ethics does evolve, right? So in other words, like I said before, the, earlier today we were talking about the Roman Empire. If you were a Roman citizen during the Roman Empire, uh, it would be perfectly okay to have slaves, right? And nowadays it's more like, eee, slavery is really morally wrong. So uh, ethics changes over the course of time, right? Uh, but people say, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So you have to judge what uh, it was like to be alive in the Roman Empire by the standards then. But according to standards now, it's different. We're living in a kind of better, scare quotes world, for example. But that's taken, what, you know, a, a, a thousand plus more years, for example. But in the case of some disaster like this, then things change very quickly, right? and I think how people view what is uh, right or wrong in an ethical sense also changes very quickly too. Um, flattening the curve saves lives, but also allows us more time to gather evidence about the effectiveness of various content tracing efforts and to develop a consensus around which uh, privacy protocols will be most effective. It will also allow time for revision, for revision to laws which depend on the revisions may be a good or a bad thing. And one word about privacy, for example, right? If, if, you're, if you're sick and have an accident, right? A uh, serious accident or whatever, right? And you're in hospital, then this notion of privacy gets thrown out the window because people will do whatever to save your life, you know? So they cut up off your clothes and the doctors and nurses and the really operating theater, see everything, etc., and they have to have all your 
details, etc., in order to save your life. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, sometimes privacy seems to be a vital concern if everything is kind of hunky-dory in the world, but if things are kind of, you know, hair-shaped, and, you know, our, our kind of love affair with, uh, you know, privacy also changes. And what the last paragraph, the complex debate around contact tracing implicates rights, fairness, common good, and utilitarian consideration. So yeah, all of these things, are, uh, you know, uh, contained in the current debate about privacy and coronavirus. It is also a debate that highlights virtue, virtues like compassion, prudence, and honesty. And what, what is the virtue of prudence, Julian? Oh. Prudence is <laughs> careful, <laughs> careful, right? Prudence is careful. There's a, a famous book, I think I just turned a certain Hollywood film, I think, called Prudence and the Pill. And, and you know what pill I'm referring to. It's like the birth control pill. Uh, pill, pill. And, uh, and Prudence is actually the name of uh, a character in this story. Because Prudence is, 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 was often a, a kind of female first name. And, uh, and Prudence also means character. So it's kind of like a, a little joke in that title. Prudence is careful in the name and careful in the technology or the drug technology. So prudence is a virtue that we should kind of be embracing in the age that we're in, as well as compassion and honesty. And, uh, oh yeah, any other points? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, don't well, take around the guy. You caught me off guard because I've, I found that uh, product. Oh, you found the article? Okay, so, so no, maybe that's the grand not finale. Article. It's not an article, it's the, it's the, it's the product. You know, the Jake and Sick was the guy caught. Oh, the right. product, the product. And so does his three girl. And so, okay. And, hey, did you read the joke? And ironically, only his girls had bought it. <laughs> it's on the comic, the answer. <laughs> I think it's around the guy caught the voice. But here, here it is. It's called Heal Light. Right? Oh, Heal Light. And, yeah, and so uh, they're looking for investors now, but they're, they're saying that it's a probable, probable. I thought it already exists. Sorry, you said my mistake. Proof of concepts, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So they're the, they're the, team, the executive team is all, all in this new business to actually get this light up and going. But then you get this other article saying highly implausible. Implausible. Okay. Yeah. And uh, anyway, the law of unintended consequences. Maybe here light has other potential uses that are even unthought of. And I think that you should look at your vast reserves of venture capital <laughs> wealth, etc., and invest in this because you know. I mean, I, you know, uh, it could add to your portfolio, right? You know, it's more like, you know, uh, I've got like 16 properties, two oil wells, and I don't know, somebody who claims that he can turn, um, you know, base metals into gold. It's kind of like, uh, trying to bring that alchemy, I think, you know? Alchemy! <laughs> yeah. But I did find it. There you go. I did find it. So, uh, yes, you, you have found it, right? So that means that, uh, you know, I don't know, yeah, questionable. Maybe, so, who knows. We'll have to put that link. What we'll yeah. have to do is, no, actually, no, when, when, when you actually cut this and put it up on the site, people that are interested can actually visit Kia Light Platform Technology and make up their minds themselves right, and see yes. if it's actually backed up uh, by um, by kind of scientific uh, research and know-how. Ah. Uh, one one thing that I want to actually uh, one last question that I want to ask um, yeah. before we uh, close up shop uh, this afternoon is I think I, I had a question I think you know, before, which is based on uh, one of the posts in the week six uh, learning materials folder about uh, the results of some weird research which is reported part of this issue of uh, does the present of teddy bears in the workplace make employees more ethical. So, Ilya, do you think that uh, having stuffed animals in the workplace would make... Uh, okay, if, if, if when you went into uh, an exam room, for example, 
or a classroom, right? If you brought in stuffed animals, koala bears, teddy bears, for example, do you think that the students would behave in a more ethical manner? That's, I, all I that, that's what this research is basically saying. Yeah, I, in my personal opinion, I think they just ignore it. They go, oh, wow, well, look, yeah, that's great. And then five minutes later, forget it. <laughs> um, but I think you see the uh, thing is, uh, this research is basically saying is memories of childhood innocence. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? The, the, the only thing Over. I can think of uh, is in, uh, in I used to manage teams. Uh, whenever I was in a meeting, I would always bring in a scrunch ball. And uh, the scrunch yeah. ball... Yeah, not a, not a teddy bear, but a scrunch ball, and uh, it took everybody's attention to it because I'd be scrunching it. Oh, what have you got the scrunch ball? So, in different meetings, I'd have to bring something different in, right? So, uh, baseball, football, and so forth, just change things up. Randomiz Randomization is always better. But uh, uh, I remember uh, the scrunch ball was uh, because in the meetings, whoever had the ball. Uh, had had the floor so they could actually talk. Everyone else had to be quiet. So you saw this ball getting tossed around between executives on the <laughs> table. Oh. It, it looked pretty funny, especially when you got someone who, who's sort of like 70 years old um, trying to catch a ball. Uh, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> oh, but wait, wait a minute. I, I know another way to actually uh, lower anxiety levels in exam rooms. Right? What about playing uh, soothing cool. music or maybe like sound effect music? You know, if you have the sound of uh, elevated waves. music. Here we go. Hang on. Here we go. Elevated music. What was the comment there? I, want to, uh, I had one on my table, a teddy bear in my office, and my son used to kick him. Sending you the teddy bear. Ah, kick him a teddy bear. Exam ah, room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there used to be that fan of uh, like a stuff the face of somebody in the office that you didn't like into the punch it. You know, <laughs> like, like somebody, I don't know, there was like a punching bag kind of thing, but it was like a, a blow up thing, right? And, and, and you'd stick on a person's face that you didn't like, you could hit it, and so you didn't actually take it, the frustrations of that person. But I think this research about the teddy bears is more about memories of childhood innocence uh, yeah. provoke. Uh, pro-social behavior, which is more like if you um, if you if you play nursery rhymes and live, if you have stuffed animals uh, in the office, if your if if your uh, corporate headquarters is next to a, a child mining facility or it has a child mining facility in it, then the chances are the people in that space will behave uh, more ethically, right? And, and from kind of left of field, right, it's research from the US that kind of indicates that there's a certain color for Baker Miller pink. And pink would also be maybe the color of childhood because the people that develop it yeah. say that it's kind of the perceived color that maybe a fetus would perceive if it could actually see when it's in other print, right? And people have used uh, Baker Miller pink to color the inside of holding cells in jails. So like in Florida, when they pick up ne'er-do-wells who have been drunk on the street, they're kind of rough and ready. They stick them into that pink room and in, in a few uh, minutes, they're as docile as lambs, right? And people have done the same thing in prisons. Some people were experimenting uh, with that in classrooms, so they could stick uh, boisterous children into the pink room, for example. But uh, in terms of science, there's no real evidence that, that suggests that, you know, this, this shade of pink, Baker Miller pink, actually has physiological effects on people. But it may have psychological effects, like presence of teddy bears. Or uh, the hearing of nursery rhymes and things happen. It can evoke memories of childhood innocence because when we were young children, we were innocent. We didn't kind of plot the overthrow of the world, for example. Right? We just wanted to have fun and play. Um, and uh, and maybe what we should do. Hey, that's what you should do. Uh, in, uh, when you cut, I dare you to find a good teddy bear and stick it somewhere in the clip. <laughs> When you, as usual, uh, this will be uh, cut and pasted and edited and blocked by YouTube, uh, no doubt. Uh, and it will end up, uh, I think, in uh, the week eight Louis Materials folder under the heading of Coronavirus Corner. And any last words, Ilya? No, and once again, thanks, thanks for being on. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, student Thank audience. You. And uh, uh, hopefully you'll be all back here next week, same time, same place in Rotovirus Corner Land. Stay safe.
Ciao. Goodbye. Thank you. Hey, see you guys. <laughs>